The Bible lays before the Christian uh, two realities that, that quite frankly seem opposed to each other. And on one hand, it says, you know, you're going to experience challenge and difficulty and, and maybe more to the point uh, for today, mental and emotional trauma. And yet we are invited into the possibility of a victory. And so it is naive for us to think, for, for any Christian to think, that you're not going to experience a rainy day, that's, that you're not going to have sadness and lament. In fact, there's a whole book of the Bible called Lamentations. It's all about lament. Um, we're we're going to experience that. Yet, and yet, we have to hold on to this idea that, that Christ does want to uh, give us victory, that there is a path to victory. Uh, so there's this tension. I mean, Jesus said, in this world, you're going to experience trouble, but rejoice because I have overcome the world. Even uh, Paul, uh, earlier, in, uh, he's a leader in the early church. He said this. He's in Romans 2. He says, excuse me, Romans 9, 2. He says that he had experienced unceasing anguish. OK, so he's saying I've experienced unceasing anguish. And yet he's also the same person in Philippians that said rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. So we have this tension. And so we're going to talk about this tension and, and, and say, look, man, it's OK. And in fact, it's, it's healthy that we're going to experience um, emotional and mental difficulties. And yet we want to contend for what the Bible says uh, for whole, wholeness and help. And, and we're launching something new today, 40 days of emotional and mental health. Uh, we're going over this for the next six weeks in our message series, but also in our groups. We don't just want to learn about this. We actually want to engage it. And, and, and move forward in it. So I want to implore you uh, to not only be in a group in these six weeks, but engage in your group. Really give yourself to this material. So we're going to take a look at this and we're going to start out today. And I want to give you a bit of a disclaimer about this series. And that is I'm coming at this from the angle of a pastor. I'm not a, a counselor. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not coming at it from that angle. I'm coming at it like I want to bring to us what the Bible has to say about each and every one of these um, emotional and mental states that we do can we can find uh, freedom in. So today we're going to look at uh, loneliness, and I'll pray for you, then we'll get started. Father, I thank you uh, for your word. I thank you that, um, Lord, we we have so much uh, hope and 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 peace in you, and and you we we have your we have your word. You, you want to speak into our lives, um, Lord. You are a loving God and caring God, and uh, you're the God who. Uh, feels when we, what we feel. You sympathize with us. We don't have a high priest who is not ab unable to sympathize with us. We thank you that you're with us even in our troubles. And we do pray. We do pray over these next 40 days that you would do just a mighty, mighty work in our hearts, in our heads, and in our lives. Amen. Amen. Well, when you look at the book of Genesis, uh, there's this created refrain uh, after the um, or excuse me, there's this repeated refrain of the created world, and that was everything was good. You know, he made this, and it was good. He made this, and it was good. And then we get to this place where, where God says something is not good. And what he said in, in Genesis uh, 2.18, is said it's not good for man to be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. Everything else was good, but the very first thing that God says wasn't good was looking at man and seeing that he was all by himself. And the reason why this isn't good is because we were created in the image of God. And God himself is a community. Uh, God, uh, it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You've got one God, but three persons. You have one what and three hues. And I know this is like, you know, this doctrine of the Trinity is really hard to get your mind around. But it's so important for us to get a fundamental understanding who we are and what we are created for. Which means that friendship, because of who God is... Because of who God is, friend, that means friendship was something that was never created, but it's just always existed. Friendship is eternal. Uh, it's a part of the eternal nature of God. There has never been a time in all of eternity where there hasn't been friendship. And you and I were created in that image. That is why when God created Adam, he said it is not good for Adam to be alone, because God is not alone, but Adam is alone. So that is not good. He's supposed to be like God. And this is going to be huge for somebody 
The fact that you and I would experience loneliness, the fact that Adam was lonely, wasn't because he was imperfect, but because he was perfect. All of our other problems arise from our sin and our imperfections. Loneliness is the one problem that you and I have because we are made in the image of God. Um, because the problem, the, the problem of loneliness happened before the fall, that is before centered, sin entered in the human equation, um, your need for friends isn't, some, isn't an indication that something is wrong with you, but actually is something that's right for you. We should want to be around people. We should want to connect deeply with people, and we do, and that's what God has created us for. We live in a world, though, where friendships are on the way down and, and loneliness is on the way up. In fact, I mean, you, you can Google this. There is an absolute epidemic of loneliness. About 50% of Americans say that they're lonely. Uh, our friends across the pond over in the U.K., uh, Theresa May, a few years back, uh, created a cabinet position called the Minister of Loneliness to, to deal with this problem. And if you Google uh, the Cigna report on loneliness, I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago, the, the health damage of loneliness. Uh, they say that it's worse for your health, your physical health, to be lonely than it is to smoke 15 cigarettes a day. It is worse for, for your health to be lonely than to be obese. In the West, we do not have material poverty, but we do have something called relational poverty. What's the difference between material poverty and relational poverty? Well, material poverty is lacking the essentials to get you through the day. Relational poverty is lacking the intimacy and the connections to live a meaningful life. You may have people all around you, but you don't feel like people care. You may have people all around you, but you don't feel like you have anyone you can trust. You may have people who are all around you, but you feel like no one really wants you. And it can be devastating. It is not good for man to be alone. And that's what God created us for. He created us for friendship. Well, why is this such a growing problem? If you're taking notes, I've got four theories on that that social experts will point to. Um, number one is the breakdown of family. Um, as the, the breakdown of family has happened, more and more people are feeling alone. Number two, the increased mobility of Americans. We move around. We don't stay one place. The average person will move uh, in their adult life 11.7 times. Years ago, generations would stay in the same community. We don't live in the same communities anymore. We uproot our families and we're not connected to our blood family, but we're also not connected to our friends. And as you know, especially if you're new uh, to one of our cities, man, it takes a little while to make friends. And I mean, maybe two or three years to make a really good friend and sometimes longer. But when we're always moving around, it just, man, we just get lonelier and lonelier. Number three, there are heavy workloads. We're busy. You ask someone how they're doing, oh, I'm busy. Uh, I'm busy. You know, you meet someone, I'm busy. We're always, always busy. We're always giving ourselves to work. We work too much. We're going to address that, actually. One of the uh, I think on October the 17th, we're going to talk about exhaustion. Number four, which such a blessing, but social media, the rise of social media. We get a glimpse of someone else's life and we feel bad about our lives. Our, you know, and so it makes us feel alone, makes us not feel included. Or we, we post a selfie or something of ourselves and we kind of wait around to see if anybody comments or see if anybody likes us. And if, if we don't get the comment that we want, if we don't get the like that we want, we feel lonely. We feel like, man, no one cares. It's a growing, growing problem. And God wants to speak into this situation. And the story that we're looking at today is about a man who was isolated because of his issue. He was all alone, uh, cut off from everyone. And Jesus comes along and he loves this man and heals this man. And I believe, I believe this with all my heart, God wants to heal you. God wants to touch you. God wants to heal you in your lonely place. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Um, so what we read here is that this man with leprosy came to Jesus. We read about this in verse 40. He came to Jesus and he was begging on his knees. This man is in a desperate situation because he has this terrible disease called leprosy, but he's uh, quarantined. 
Um, he's totally isolated from his disease. So not only does he have this physical problem, but he has this emotional problem as well as he's cut off from community. You can read about this in Leviticus 13, which I'll just go ahead and read this verse for you right now. Two verses, excuse me, in verse 45. Anyone with such a defiling disease as leprosy must, be, must wear torn clothes. Um, they let their hair be all un- uh, unkept. They must cover the lower part of their face and then when they come into uh, an area, they see in anywhere close to people, they have to yell, unclean, unclean. And as long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. Now, you and I just found out about social distancing 18 months ago. But social distancing has been around for centuries Sometimes we like to think of our struggles as being innovative uh, and new, but it's not new to God. All the issues that we face, whatever you face, God cares. He wants to meet you there. He met this man and he wants to meet you. I mean, here's a guy, this sounds so familiar, doesn't it? I mean, they had to wear a cover over the lower part of their face and they had to be quarantined until it was over. And maybe some of you are feeling that way. Maybe not so much with, could be with, the, the pandemic or maybe something else. You feel quarantined. You feel cut off. And this man was certainly cut off. God cares for you. He's not going to treat you the way the world treats you. In this situation, Jesus had every right as a clean person. Any clean person had the right, the legal right to pick up a stone and throw it at any leper who got within 50 paces. That is how the world treated lepers, is that if they got anywhere near you, they could legal, someone could legally pick up a rock and throw it at you. But that's not how Jesus treated them. Some of you are suffering at the hands of what culture says about you. Issues that make you feel like an outcast. Issues that make you feel like nobody cares. I am here to announce to you that Jesus absolutely cares. And he doesn't want to hurt you. He wants to heal you. He's not come into this world to condemn the world. He has come into this world to save the world. He wants to save you. He wants to heal you. You don't have to be alone. You don't have to hide. You don't have to be uh, off to the side. But make no mistake, this guy, and then you may feel this way, this guy was taking a massive risk in approaching Jesus. And you may feel that way. You may feel like you're taking a massive risk to step outside your comfort zone and approach one. This man was taking a huge, huge risk. We don't know much about this guy. We don't know much about his name. We don't know about his hopes and dreams. We don't know if he liked Pepsi or Coke. We don't know anything about this guy. The only thing we know about this guy is his issue. We don't know if his fam- about his family and friends that he was estranged from. We don't know what he did for a living that this disease robbed from him. All we know is his issue. In fact, notice he had to wear torn clothes. Now, today we do that for fashion. We wear torn clothes. Today we do that to communicate a style. But in that day, along with having unkept hair, you were announcing that I am a crazy person that you don't want to be around. It was a way of identifying you from a distance. You didn't, you didn't have kept hair. You had torn clothes. In fact, you had to yell out, unclean, unclean. This was an issue that had completely dominated his life. He had isolated him physically, had isolated him emotionally. He is in a lonely place, just like many of you are in a lonely place. You're not just a little bored. I mean, you're not just cooped up, but you have, there's some issue in your life that is keeping you isolated from people, making you feel like you're all alone. In fact, you may even feel like your issue goes before you, just like with this man. I mean, he had to announce who is, what his issue was, and no one ever really got to know him. His issue was that big to him, isolating him. But this man is bold. He was pressing into Jesus. I just want to encourage you this morning to press in to Jesus. He is a safe place. You may be in a lonely place, but he is a safe place. Most of us, though, are not willing to let our issues be known. For for those watching online, what if your issue was put in the chat box? What if you had to put your issue in the chat box just to stay connected? Would you stay connected? Or maybe if you're in one of our in-person services, one of our physical locations, 
and someone didn't just ask you, hey, how are you doing? But they ask you, hey, what issue are you hiding? Or maybe instead of like, you know, in the middle of the service when we ask people, hey, give somebody a fist bump. What if they said, hey, what was your, what was the temptation that you gave into last week? Would you stick around? Probably not. What if all of my thoughts right now, what if all my thoughts last week, we'll say it that way, were to show up on the lower third screen and not just the verses that I quote? Would I show up? Would you, would you still accept me? Would I still have a job? I don't know, probably not. In this situation, actually, leprosy was slow moving. There was, you could detect early signs of leprosy long before it became a, a massive problem. He was supposed to go to, in fact, you're supposed to go to the priest as soon as you notice even just the slightest indication that you may have this. But perhaps when he, it first started for him, it's just something that he kept covered up. You know, he kind of put a jacket on or an extra article of clothing to cover up what could be an issue. Because you know how it is. When something comes and pops up in your life and it's a little thing, you want to cover it up. You know, you erase your browser history, you, you move money from one account to the next, and or you, you, know, you find a place in your house that nobody really knows what you're up to. But with this man, eventually, this disease, this issue had spread to the point to where he could no longer cover it up, and to the point it did push him into a lonely, isolated place. And you may not have spots on the outside of you, but we all have spots on the inside of us, on our soul. We have issues. We have things that we cover up and we hide and that are dominating our life. And it causes us to lurk around in the dark, isolated from other people, causing us extreme loneliness. And if you want to, be, if you want to know the truth, what makes us feel lonely, what makes us feel unloved is the fact that we hide behind these issues. Or I'll say it another way, we hide these issues. We keep these issues hidden. And what happens if anybody shows you any kind of affection, if anyone shows you any kind of kindness, if anyone shows you any kind of generosity, what you think, whether consciously or unconsciously, you think they just love the pretend me. They don't really know me. If they knew me, they would not love me. And because the issue stays in the dark, because the issue does not come to the surface, your loneliness gets deeper and deeper and deeper. When I was meditating on the story, I started to think of my, about myself like, man, I've got spots. They're not visible, but they're there. It might be better if they were visible because then we could just all stop pretending because we, you and I tend to address the things that are visible, things that are on the outside of us, the way we look, our clothes, our hair, our waistline, our hairlines, our cars, our homes, our Instagrams. We fix the problems that, we could, that other people can see, but we don't tend to address the problems that people can't see. But it's what people can't see that's making you and I feel alone. Again, this man broke through this shame. It broke through his excuses, even broke through tradition and he came all the way to the feet of Jesus. Now, you and I know too much. We know how the story ends. We know that Jesus heals him. But you have to put yourself in the man's shoes, the, the leper's shoes, the leper's shoes. He, it was a risky move for this man. In fact, it was a risky move for Jesus. And here's why. The unclean makes the clean unclean. Anytime someone, this is why this was such a big deal. That's why the quarantining was such a big deal. That's why all the distance was a big deal. That's why they, all the stuff that they had to do was a big deal. Because if the unclean came in contact with the clean, then the clean became unclean. This man is saying, if you're willing to be dirty by association, he knew what he was asking Jesus. I know that if I touch you, I'm going to make you dirty by association. It's going to cost you, Jesus. Because Jesus does something here more than just healing the person. He came to him. You know, this is what he came to do. He didn't just heal this person. 
but he touched this person. And here's the thing. Typically, the clean, excuse me, the unclean makes the clean unclean. But in this situation, the clean made the unclean clean. It was going to cost him, though. It cost it to help the lonely. You know, think about the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, you know, the, uh, the story where the priest goes by. He knew that if he touched this person, he was going to become unclean. and It was going to cost him a lot. And he's going to have to do all these different rituals. But with Jesus, Jesus is the great high priest. He is the one clean one. And he set this person free. Jesus says, I am willing. He says, I am willing to make you clean. And again, he could have just spoken the word, but he showed it. This is very, very dramatic. And I just want to speak once again for those of you who are experiencing this loneliness. Jesus can touch your life. Jesus can. He wants to be the God who comes near and touches that lonely place and heals whatever it is that is causing you to be isolated. Whatever that issue is, it's causing you to feel like, man, no one loves me. No one cares about me. You may be surrounded by people. I was in New York a few weeks ago. I was in Chicago the last couple weeks. Millions of people around. But man, you could feel the loneliness in the city because you have so many people around you, but yet you don't feel connected to anyone. And maybe you feel that way. You feel like, man, I mean, you're even around people. But you, you don't feel connected because, man, you still have that issue. Jesus wants to heal you. He wants to make you well. He wants to put the lonely in families. That's what God does. God is, God is a God who wants to extend friendship to us. He says in John 15, I, I, I don't just call you servants, I call you friends. And he didn't just call us friends, but he puts us into families. It says that in Psalm 68, 6, God sets the lonely in families. In John 15, he says, I will not leave you as orphans, but he wants to connect us. He wants us to connect with him, but he wants us to connect with others. That's one of the reasons why we talk so much about groups around here, about relationship and togetherness, like, like in our groups. Like when you get in your groups and we go through this series and you're going to hear this, this phrase, this terminology, crossing the line of shame. Why do we do that? Why do we say we want to do that? Because it is so important for you to feel like people really know you and love you and accept you. That you and I, that you and I could do this for, for others, that we could be like Jesus for other people. So people, someone does say something to you. Someone does confess an issue to you. We don't want to be the people like, <gasps> we want to be the people who love and accept and wrestle with. And yeah, let's get out of that. Let's get free. Let's get better. But we want to be a place where it's okay not to be okay, where we can share those things so we don't have to hide in loneliness. It's bad enough that we all have these issues and we all have them. But it's what makes it worse is that we don't feel like we can actually be ourselves and we just be live dissected individual lives, which is not God's plan. He wants us to be in family. He wants us to be, he wants to call us friends. He wants to bring us into intimate relationship. Now, one more thing before we close that just actually blew my mind about this story because I think, you know, this is the only time that, you know, he heals lepers in other places. And, you know, I've been preaching sermons for 17 years and I preached this sermon before. And, you know, I've always been at the point where it's like, oh, he didn't just say the word, but, you know, he touched him. And isn't that amazing? But there's something about, I read in this, this last verse, verse 45, that I want to tell you to, that, man, just brings tears to my eyes, the love that Jesus has for you and I. It, it communicates something about how much he loves you. It communicates something about how much he wants to heal you and how far he went to make it all right. And it's this. In verse 45, it said that, well, let me go back. Excuse me. Let me go back to um, verse 43. In verse 43, it says, Jesus sent him away and he gave him a strong warning. Like the, the language here, actually, if you get into the Greek, it's like his nostrils flared. He is snorting Jesus. I mean, he is intense. And he gives us this warning. He says, see to it, see that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifice that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. 
And then it says, instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. Now, let me just explain something to you at this point in Jesus' ministry. Jesus is becoming wildly popular. But yet he wasn't a person who was motivated by the popularity. He wasn't motivated by the crowds. He was motivated by his purpose. And later in this text, it's like he, he, he left the crowds. Remember that? He left the crowds out of purpose because he wanted to live for the reason which God had sent him. And his time was not yet ready for him uh, to go public the way that he was meant to go public so that's why he said, hey, look, don't, I, I, I'm not wanting to be public yet, so don't tell anyone. And he was very serious about it. And then it says this, as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. So here's the thing. Jesus knew what this guy was going to do, right? He's God. So he knew, even though he warned him, he knew that this, guy, that this guy was going to go around and tell everyone, forcing Jesus to go to a lonely place. He knew what he was going to do, but he did it anyway. So it wasn't even that he just healed this man, but he traded places with this man. When the story began, the, the leper was in a lonely place, and by the end of the story, Jesus had traded places with them, and he went to the lonely place. You see, that's what Jesus does for us. He just doesn't heal us. He just doesn't speak a word. He doesn't even touch us. Here's the thing about Jesus, is that he trades places with us. Second Corinthians 5, 21, he that knew no sin became our sin, so that we could have the righteousness of God. And in this story, he didn't just heal him, but he switched places with him. He went to the lonely places so this man could be free and to be in community. And that's what he wants to do for you. He loves you so much. He's just not willing to speak a word. He's not just willing to take a risk. He's willing to trade places with you. And he traded places with you on the cross. He loves you so much. He wants to heal every deep place. You can trust him. We do not have a high priest who is disconnected from us, but it says he sympathizes with us, which means that he feels what you and I feel. He feels your pain. He feels your loneliness. He feels your isolation. And he wants to meet you there. He's traded places with you. So here's what I want you to do. I just want you, if wherever you're at, just, just, if, if you want God to touch you, just lift up your hands. I just want to pray for you. God, we just thank you. Just thank you that you loved us so much. You were willing to come close, but more than that, you were willing to trade places with us. And God, I just pray for every person who feels in isolation, feels like no one cares, who feels not just boredom and, and wishing this pandemic would end and I want life to be back to normal, but there's deep loneliness. There is isolation. There is a feeling that no one cares. But God, I pray, Lord, I pray right now that you would make real to every man, woman, and child watching this that you do care and that you do love, and you have come to put, not just put yourself at risk, but you have come to give your life away for us. And I just pray for every hand raised, I just pray, Lord God, that you would touch that lonely place. I pray you would give them freedom from that issue. God, I pray you draw them closer to people. And God, we pray that we would be a people who go goes out and, and finds those in lonely places, that we would be a community of people who extend friendship, extend intimacy. It says in Hebrews 13, it says, because he went outside the city and suffered reproach, let us go outside and suffer with him. And that's what you and I, I wanna leave you with that thought that, that God heals you, but he doesn't, he doesn't just heal you, it says that he comforts those so that we can go and comfort others with the same comfort that we've been comforted with. And because he went outside the city, because he traded places with us, because he was willing to go to that lonely place for us, may you and I be those who are willing to go outside. What does that look like? It means that we don't just huddle up 
and clicks and everything else, but we, we, we love each other, we're, we're, we're connected, but we're willing to look outside of ourselves. We're, look, we're willing to look at the person who may be, feel different, act different, look different, but we, we love that we wanna go outside of the city to bring them in, to bring them into family. God is a God who brings the lonely into families.